chapter one is introduction to the human body. So we begin the study of the human body here in this chapter, and we understand the complexity of organization and function uh, that is found in the human organism. So we're gonna just go over the importance of a couple just terms and definitions uh, as we get started here into um, this survey of anatomy and physiology course. So just some definitions here that we need to go over, but anatomy is the study of structure and organization of the body. And we have gross anatomy that is large, easily observable parts seen during dissection without a lens. And then we have microanatomy that is structures only seen through a microscope such as tissues and cells. And then we have the word physiology that means how the body and its parts function. So anatomy is the parts that make us up and physiology is how do those parts come together and work together to maintain homeostat homeostasis in our body, which is a healthy balance or, or equilibrium, I guess you could say. So gross anatomy, you know, that's your parts that you can see without a microscope, so that you know you could see the, the liver, the, you know, the gallbladder, those type of things. Um, but then microanatomy, you have to have a, a microscope um, to see those, and that would be, you know, your tissues and your cells, like your blood cells or your connective tissues or your epithelial tissues. So levels of the structural organization. This slide is very important. Um, this slide goes over a lot of information here, but notice how you have the different levels. We start out from the left up here at the top uh, with an atom, and then we go from an atom to a molecule, a molecule to a macromolecule, and then to an organelle. Now, all of that comprises the chemical level. Now, it's important to understand that the chemical level is the simplest level. Okay, so the chemical level is the most basic. You have to have an atom, a molecule, a macromolecule, then an organelle before you can have anything else, such as a cell or a tissue and, or an organ. So that is the chemical level and it is the simplest, most basic level. Then you go to the cellular level, we reach to the cell, and that of course, you know, cells, um, which are, they are the basic structural and functional unit of the body, and of course they contain your organelle, your macromolecule, your molecule, and your atom. So you can see that everything builds on one another, and we just keep getting more and more um, structurally advanced as we go. So then you reach the tissue level, and that's um, you know similar cells that perform similar functions. Then you get to the organ level, and that's two or more tissues uh, that work together to perform specific functions. Then you get to the um, organ system level, and that's a group of organs that work together to perform specific um, system functions. And there are a total of 11 um, organ systems. So what we're gonna do in this course is we're gonna go through each um, of those systems and we're going to discuss them individually um, kind of diving into the depth of each of the uh, individual organ systems and then of course once we get our organ systems um, then we reach an actual organism so when you get to be an organism then you have all of these uh, different levels comprised together to make the organism So now let's go over an organ system overview, just very, very basic um, for each organ system. So when we go through this course, we will have an individual chapter on each organ system. So the integumentary system, that's your skin, hair, nails, and associated glands. Now that is the anatomy of the integumentary system. But what is the physiology? The physiology is the things that that anatomy does, again, to promote equilibrium um, for homeostasis purposes in our body. So our integumentary system, such as our skin, uh, protects deeper tissue from injury. And we know that it does this by, uh, you know, taking lots of uh, abrasion and cuts and burns and that type of thing. Our skin takes a lot of abuse uh, in order to protect uh, deeper tissue from injury. Synthesizes vitamin D. Let's talk about that one for just a moment. So when we synthesize vitamin D, 
What that means is that is that vitamin D promotes calcium absorption in the gut and maintains adequate um, calcium and phosphate concentrations in our body. Now this in turn um, enables mineralization of like of our bones. It prevents, um, you know, uh, low calcium levels. It's good for our immune system. You'll find out lots and lots of stuff that vitamin D is good for in your body. So how do we synthesize vitamin D by our integumentary system? Well, sunlight. Sunlight, we absorb sunlight in our skin and that in turn synthesizes vitamin D. Now, this is not, you know, getting um, too much sunlight um, as far as um, skin damage. This just means, you know, walking to your classes every day or getting out and about or having the, you know, your windows open in your home or whatever. Now, if someone was shut in or they lived somewhere with no sunlight and it was complete, complete darkness, now they would be vitamin D deficient. And what that would mean would be that they would, their body, uh, even if they ate foods that contained vitamin D, the gut would not absorb the vitamin D. Um, be, and the calcium, of course, because we, we talked about how it promotes vitamin D, promotes calcium absorption. So um, they would be vitamin D deficient. So in turn, they might have weak, fragile bones because we don't get to um, absorb the calcium in our gut. So anyway, it's very important that we synthesize vitamin D, uh, of course, from the sunlight. So again, that is you know needed for bone growth and bone remodeling. Uh, and we'll learn all about that in the skeletal system. So without sufficient vitamin D, your bones can become thin and brittle. And um, adequate amounts of vitamin D prevent things like uh, rickets in children. Uh, and calcium, of course, prevents osteoporosis in the adult. So very, very important there. Helps regulate body temperature. Now that's, um, you know, just meaning that uh, when your body is overheated, it uh, sweats. To cool down and when it, and of course your core body temperature at 98.6 you know approximately uh, so when your when your temperature reaches above that point then your body is going to naturally sweat to cool it down and that's reaching a balance that's reaching homeostasis so same is if you are too cold what does your body do to get you back to 98.6 or as close to well, it sweats. We sweat. Uh, excuse me. We shiver. I'm sorry. We shiver in order to, um, you know, warm our body up. So those two things, you know, sweating and shivering, those two things, again, regulate our body temperature. And we do that through our skin. So the skeletal system is the next organ system that we're going to go over. And the skeletal system is made up of our bones, our ligaments, and associated cartilages. That is the anatomy of the skeletal system. The physiology is it supports, supports the body, protects vital organs, and it is the site of blood cell formation, and it stores minerals. So let's go over that and talk about that for just a moment. So with the anatomy being the bones, ligaments, and cartilages, and then the physiology being supporting the body. So how do we support the body? We support the body by things like, you know, the rib cage supporting, um, um, you know, the core of our body, the, the limbs, the arms, the legs, supporting the weight of our body, that type of thing. Well, how do we protect vital organs? Well, the sternum, the rib cage, all that protects the heart, protects the lungs, the skull protects the brain. So we are protecting vital organs. Site of blood cell formation. Let's talk about that for just a moment. So with site of blood cell formation, what that means is is that we produce blood cells in our bones, uh, in the red bone marrow specifically. So it's a process called hematopoiesis, and this is just a process to where we uh, generate red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets through our bone tissue, such as, like I said, the red bone marrow. And again, that might have been something that you might not have known, but it's very important to understand where your blood cells originate from. And then stores minerals. We probably knew that we stored calcium, but you might not have known um, that we store phosphorus. So in that topic there of the blood cell formation, just remember it's the red bone marrow that produces red and white blood cells. And that's a process called hematopoiesis. Don't worry about learning that word just quite yet. You'll get to that in the blood chapter as well as the skeletal system chapter. 
Um, so we're just going over a quick overview here in chapter one, kind of what each organ system does. Um, so, and then in your red bone marrow, just to let you know, that is actually an area that is found in the hollow spaces of our bones. Uh, so that's kind of where it's located. Now, the muscular system, uh, we are responsible, you know, we have our muscles here, that'd be the anatomy, um, and then movement and produces heat. That would be the physiology as far as what it does, what actions it takes. So the primary job of muscles is to move the bones of the skeleton, but again, muscle also makes the heartbeat um, and of course makes up the walls of other important organs. So. We have muscles that are found inside of organs like the stomach, the intestines, and the blood vessels. You have your cardiac muscle uh, that, of course, is found only in the heart that's responsible for pumping uh, the blood throughout the body. Uh, you've got your skeletal muscles that are, you know, how we move and how we speak and walk and write and those type of things. So a lot of things go into the muscular system that you might not have thought of. Um, so in like for movement, uh, it, for movement goes, um, you know, muscles are the only tissue in the body that has the ability to contract and therefore move the other parts of the body. So like maintaining our posture or our body position, that would also be an example. The respiratory system, uh, the respiratory system is, you know, here's your uh, anatomy such as your nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, uh, the bronchus, the left lung, that type of thing is your anatomy. Physiology is that it exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide between air and blood in the lungs. So when we breathe in, we take in um, oxygen and that oxygen, of course, we want it to go to all of the tissues in the body. And when it does that, it supplies adequate amounts of oxygen to all of your vital organs. And then once, and of course it, it our oxygen is transported through our body through our red blood cells, okay? So when it distributes oxygen to all your vital organs, then it in exchange, that red blood cell picks up carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, transports it back to the lungs, and then of course we exhale to get rid of carbon dioxide. The cardiovascular system is our heart, heart and our blood and vessels, vessels as far as the anatomy. anatomy. And what, what is, is our physiology? physiology? Well, it transports it materials, materials in the body, the body uh, by, by blood, blood pumped, pumped by the by heart. The heart. So things like oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients and waste are things that are transported um, by the blood, uh, being pumped by the heart. And again, we breathe in oxygen, it goes to our red blood cells, our red blood cells our, our blood is pumped by the heart through the rest of the body. So we deliver oxygen, nutrients to the, to the areas that, that we need to deliver it. We pick up waste, carbon dioxide, we carry it back to the lungs, and of course we breathe it off. And all that is possible because of the cardiovascular system, because of the pumping mechanism of the heart. The lymphatic system, the lymphatic system collects, cleanses, and returns interstitial fluid to the blood, and it provides our immunity. So here is just, a, we're gonna, in this chapter, when we discuss the lymphatic system, we're gonna discuss all about our immunity and how we can keep our body safe and healthy as far as uh, we have, you know, passive and we have active immunity. And we, you know, this comes from forms such as, um, you know, uh, whether it be, uh, immunizations for example or um, you know being exposed to something and and you know building up an immunity to that from the exposure different types of immunity but th that's what the lymphatic system is all going to be about the urinary system the urinary system regulates the volume and composition of the blood by forming and excreting urine so you know you've got your kidney you've got your ureter your urinary bladder your urethra all of that is the anatomy of it. The endocrine system, this um, is one of my favorite chapters to discuss and it's all about the hormones of the body. So here we secrete hormones that regulate all of our body functions. Um, so everything from your sleep-wake cycle to your stress levels, uh, all of those type of things um, is coming from the endocrine system. So you've got your pineal gland, your pituitary gland, your thyroid gland, the thymus gland, 
the adrenal gland, pancreas, and, and then of course your reproductive organs, uh, all that make up the anatomy of the endocrine system. The nervous system rapidly coordinates body functions and enables learning and memory. So with the nervous system, um, this is, you'll hear it kind of referred to as the granddaddy of all the systems of your body, because this is your brain and this is your spinal cord and this is your nerves and this is sending everything out to your body. So if something in the nervous system gets damaged, then that affects every other area in the body as well. The digestive system, here we break down food, we allow for nutrient absorption to the blood, and we eliminate indigestible material. So you've heard the term, you are what you eat. Well, when we eat healthy, we again, we break down all the food that we eat, but if we eat healthy, then we're all, you know, we're absorbing all of those nutrients that we have taken in. Now, if you eat all these unhealthy things, then you are eliminating most of it and not absorbing anything because there's no well, you're absorbing things such as the fat and the cholesterol and those type of things, but not any nutrients because there's no nutrients in those type of foods. And then, of course, we eliminate anything that is indigestible. And then we have the reproductive system, and that'll be the last chapter that we go over this semester, chapter 14, and this is just the production of offspring. So we get into it very vaguely. Um, a lot of times we do run, at, run close on time there at the very end, uh, but it is discussing the production of offspring. So let's go over some language of anatomy, um, some special terminology that we use to prevent misunderstanding of uh, medical terms. So we have you know, exact terms for position, direction, regions, and structures. So the anatomical position, um, the body is erect, meaning standing straight, the feet are parallel, the arms are hanging at the side, and the palms are facing forward with the thumbs out. And here's an example of what that looks like. This is the anatomical position. Um, so in this, uh, you will obviously not see any diagrams or pictures on your unit exams, but I can ask questions from them. Now you will see diagrams and photos, pictures on your lab exams, but not on your unit exams. But this is in your notes, so this is what I, I could ask about this now, and I will ask things like, you need to know the correct anatomical uh, terminology for, like I might say, what is the correct terminology for neck? Well, it's cervical. What is the correct terminology for armpit? It's axillary. So you need to know what the proper terminology is now at this point. So this is the anatomical position. Now, some directional terms um, that we go through here, anterior and posterior. Another word for anterior is ventral, and uh, that means toward the front of the body or in front of. So an example of that might be the breastbone is anterior to the spine. Um, the um, you know rib cage is anterior to the spine. So it's in front of. Posteriors are at the opposite, toward the back of the body or behind. So another word for posterior also is dorsal. And you could say, you know, the heart is posterior to the breastbone or proper terminology would be sternum. So the heart would be posterior to the sternum. That would be an example of posterior. Then you have superior and inferior. Superior is toward the head or above. So kind of pretend like your body is divided in half, toward the top is superior, toward the bottom is inferior. Uh, another word for superior that you might see is cranial, and you could say the head is superior to the abdomen. The um, you know cervical region, which is your neck, is um, superior to the patellar region, and that's your knee. So it's just above it, it's toward the head. Inferior, another name for inferior would be caudal, C-A-U-D-A-L, caudal, and that means away from the head or below. So um, you could, you know, say um, the patellar region, which is the knee, is inferior to the um, cervical region, which is the neck. It is away from the head or it's below. So again, know how to use those terms 
in relationship to your anatomical position. So what I'll do is ask questions on test that use this terminology in order to um, provide an example. Of how, so I will not ask direct definitions of these directional terms. I will ask you, I will put examples on the test and you will have to select um, if it's anterior, or posterior, or superior, or inferior, that type of thing. So medial toward the midline of the body. Medial is like the heart is medial to the arms because it's toward the midline of the body and the arms are on the outside of the body or away from the midline. Lateral is away from the midline, so it's right the opposite. So the arms would be lateral to the heart because again, it's away from the midline. So if you notice I had these grouped together, they're right opposite of one another. Parietal and visceral. Parietal is pertaining to the outer boundary of body cavity, so that's kind of belonging to the walls of the organs. And then visceral is pertaining to the internal organs itself. So again, with directional terms on the unit exams, the final exam, every time you're tested um, on these, it is going to be based on examples, not direct definitions here. So some more directional terms here that we need to go through is superior. I'm sorry, not superior, superficial. Superficial is toward the body surface. So superficial would be like at the body surface. So the skin would be superficial to the skeletal muscles. That's just an example. Deep, away, deep means away from the body surface. So deep would mean like more internal. So the lungs would be deep to the skin. And I'm just, I'm, again, I'm making a sentence with, with each word to give you an example. Um, we have proximal and distal. So proximal means close to the point of the attachment of a limb to the body trunk. So proximal Again, okay, let's talk about proximal and distal for a moment. So you've got your limbs, that's your arms and your legs, and then you've got your body trunk. So proximal and distal is talking about the point of attachment, where your arms are attached, so at your you know shoulders, and where your legs are attached, so at the pelvic region. Um, so proximal is closer to the point of attachment of those limbs. So in other words, proximal would be closer to the shoulder area or closer to the pelvic area because that's where those limbs are attached. So an example of proximal might be um, the uh, elbow is proximal to the wrist. That's because it is closer to the point of attachment of that limb, which is the arm, to that body trunk. Distal, on the other hand, we could say the knee or the patellar, let's use professional terminology there, would be distal to the thigh region. And that's because it is farther from the point of attachment to that limb, the leg, to the body trunk. So don't get those two mixed up. Then we've got central at or near the center of the body or organ. Uh, so again, central is just the center. So then maybe the nose could be center uh, to the ears because the ears are away and the, and the nose is in the center. And then peripheral is external to or away from the center of the body or organ. So the ears could be peripheral to the nose. So it all depends on how the sentence is worded. But, but just know that when I ask these terminology, directional terms, I will give it to you in a sentence example and you would have to know how to apply these directional terms. Body planes and sections. So a plane is an imaginary line through the body and a section is a cut. So when you look at these, um, and again, like we have directions, you know, north, south, east, west, that tells us directions to go, the same is true in relation to the locations of structures in the body. So let's look at here are types of cuts. Uh, sagittal, sagittal, is uh, a lengthwise cut dividing the right and the left parts of the body. So just kind of pretend like you've had a cut, you know, it's also called mid-sagittal as well there in the diagram. But just pretend like you have a cut straight down the body from the nose down to the navel, straight down. Uh, and you have a right side and you have a left side. So 
Then you've got frontal, and the frontal divides the anterior and the posterior. So again, the frontal plane is like you cut yourself down the side of your body, like from your, from you know down the ear, uh, the side there. And that you would have a front portion and a back portion. So you'd have an anterior and a posterior. Then you've got transverse, and that's a horizontal cut dividing the top and the bottom half. So you've got a superior, and then you've got an inferior portion of the body. Body cavities and membranes, we have two major cavities of the body that contain internal organs. You've got your dorsal and you've got your ventral. Uh, the body cavities protect and cushion the contained organs and permit changes in their size and shape without impacting surrounding tissues. So with your uh, dorsal, the dorsal is like, you know, the cranial cavity, the brain, um, the vertebral cavity, then you've got your ventral cavity, that's your, you know, your lungs, your heart, the thoracic area. So again, the cranial cavity houses the brain and the vertebral cavity contains the spinal cord. So divided by the diaphragm, a thin, which is a thin shaped sheet of muscle into a superior thoracic cavity and an inferior abdominal pelvic cavity. The thoracic cavity is protected by the rib cage and contains the heart and the lungs. The mediastinum is the central region that separates the lungs into the right and, and left uh, lungs appropriately. So the abdominal pelvic cavity is sub subdivided into, we have the abdominal cavity that contains the stomach, the intestines, the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, spleen, and kidneys. Then we've got the pelvic cavity that contains the urinary bladder, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, and the internal reproductive organs. Then the dorsal cavity is lined by three layers of protective membranes that are collectively called the meninges. And we have, um, you know, this membrane here called the serous membrane that is lining the body cavities that do not open to the exterior of the body and the surfaces of the contained internal organs. So the space between the two layers is filled with serous fluid. That's a watery fluid to reduce friction. And it always occurs in pairs. You've got the parietal that lines the cavity and you've got the visceral that covers the organs. So as organs rub against one another or the ventral cavity wall, the fluid and the serous membranes provide a smooth friction reducing surface. You've got three types of serous membranes. We've got the peritoneum that is around the abdominal cavity the peritoneal cavity, that's the space between the parietal and the visceral peritoneal membranes. Then you've got the pleura that is around the lungs. You've got the pleural cavity, and that's the space between the parietal and the visceral pleura. Then you've got the pericardium, that's around the heart. And, that's the, and then you've got, the, of course, that cavity that's the space between the visceral and the parietal pericardium. Now, your abdominal pelvic regions Again, photos, you will only see photos on lab exams, and those are also uploaded into your lab exam appropriate modules, so you'll see those again. I do not, I will not, you know, I should label anything on unit exams. It's just strictly multiple choice, note questions. Um, here are different areas of the abdominal pelvic region and what is actually contained in each area or each region. Maintenance of life. Let's talk about metabolism for a moment. So it's very important to understand that metabolism is all the chemical reactions involved in life processes such as our growth, our reproduction, our digestion, our absorption, and our excretion. All of these things. And it occurs in two phases. You have anabolism and you have catabolism. Now anabolism is the processes that use energy to build complex molecules that compose the body. So this requires the input of energy. Now note, you need to make sure to note that anytime you see the word energy, I want you to think ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That is your form of energy in your body. Um, so with anabolism, we have to have ATP because we're building complex molecules. So examples would be like bone growth or muscle mass buildup. And then right the opposite, you've got catabolism. Now here, we break down those complex molecules into simpler molecules and then therefore we release ATP or energy. We do not require it, we release it. 
So for instance, large molecules such as a polysaccharide or a nucleic acid or a protein, they're broken down into their smaller subunits known as a, you know, a polysaccharide would be broken down to a monosaccharide, a nuclei, uh, excuse me, a nucleic acid would be broken down to a nucleotide, and then a protein would be broken down into an amino acid. So it's breaking those complex molecules down. All right, our survival needs, we have to have nutrients. That's chemicals used for energy and cell building. Um, we have to have oxygen, obviously. That's the gas necessary for all of our chemical reactions. We have to have water. So our body is 60 to 80% body weight of water. It provides our fluid base for all of our chemical reactions to occur. So we have to have water. Body temperature, core body temperature is 98.6. That is necessary for metabolic reactions to occur. So when your core body temperature gets too low, reactions will slow down and they could possibly stop. If they get too high, reactions could happen too fast, of course, and damage cells. And then you have to have atmospheric pressure that is required for breathing to occur. Now we reach homeostasis. Homeostasis is maintaining a stable internal environment. So that is, again, our tendency of an organism or a cell to regulate its internal conditions, usually uh, by a system of feedback controls. So as to stabilize our health and functioning, you know, we regulate our body temperature to maintain that 98.6. So again, if we um, get overheated, we sweat to cool our body down. If we are too cold, we shiver to warm our body up. And all of that is, again, your body naturally maintaining homeostasis. Um, so homeostatic imbalance, that is any time that the body is unable to, uh, to balance that environment. So this is how we get, you know, diabetes or high blood pressure, which is known as hypertension, arthritis, because we have an imbalance in the environment of our body where we are not at homeostasis. And that is when we have a, um, like I said, something to occur as a result of that imbalance. So with the feedback, homeostasis is maintained uh, by the body responding to feedback. So feedback is information from the environment, both your internal environment inside your body as well as the external environment. So parts of a feedback loop, you have a receptor, you have a control center, and you have an effector. So the receptor, that is a change is detected. So a receptor is a stimulus. A stimulus is any type of change. Um, so you determine you know, it's cold. Maybe you went outside and you're in shorts and a short sleeve shirt and it's 30 degrees today. And the stimulus is that your your body temperature has changed. It has dropped. So you, a change has been detected. Then the control center is a decision is made regarding what to do with the information. So that goes to your nervous system and in your brain, you're going to decide, okay, what do I do to fix this? Well, you're either going to go change clothes, you're going to go get a blanket, you're going to go get a jacket, whatever it may be. And I'm just using a simple example here. But a decision is made regarding what to do with the other information. Then the effector is a response is carried out. So that's the action. So again, all of that has to take place in order to maintain homeostasis in the body. So two feedback loops that we see are the negative and the positive feedback loops. So the negative feedback loop is the effect of the response to the stimulus is to shut off the original or reduce its intensity. Almost all metabolic reactions are controlled by negative feedback. So with negative feedback, um, a reaction that this is a reaction that would cause a decrease in function. So again, it occurs in response to a stimulus. So here's an example. An example might be your human body temperature, shivering and sweating. So again, it's, it's put down in your notes that your negative feedback brings you back to normal as quickly as possible or homeostasis as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, like your blood pressure, if your blood pressure is high, those signals are sent to the brain from the blood vessels, and then those signals are sent to the heart from the brain, and then all of a sudden the heart rate slows down, thus helping the blood pressure to go back to normal. So again, it's whatever function needs to occur in order to uh, decrease or reduce that intensity of that effect. Um, so maybe like when a person is hungry, what's gonna happen to the metabolism? Metabolism is gonna slow down. Why? To conserve energy and allow the, uh, the body to continue to live with less food. 
again, it's trying to maintain homeostasis. Now, right the opposite, we have positive feedback. The original stimulus is increased and the response is continually pushed farther. So here, this results in the amplification or growth of the output signal. So maybe like the onset of contractions in childbirth, when a contraction occurs, oxytocin is released into the body, stimulating more contractions. Thus, the result is an increased amplitude and frequency of contractions. Um, so anyway, we're again, we're going, you can put in your notes, you're going farther from homeostasis for something to occur, such as childbirth. Um, and sometimes positive feedback processes must be completed very quickly. For example, the immediate danger from a severe cut uh, would be the loss of blood, so which can lower the blood pressure and reduce efficiency of the heart. This damage, of course, will send the body's response to begin the process of blood clotting, which is another example here. And this is just patching the vessel wall and stopping the bleeding. So again, positive feedback and negative feedback. Both of those, two totally different things, uh, but those are both feedback loops that are maintaining homeostasis of the body. So that is chapter one overview and lecture um, that you need to watch and, pay, and, and study your notes in preparation for uh, chapter one, which will be on your unit one exam.